I started reading about the animal brain and animal behavior. And I stumbled on the fact that animals have the same brain chemicals that we have. Oh. And the chemicals that we always hear about that make us happy, like dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphin, that they're the same in animals. Welcome to the Invigor Medical Podcast, where we sit down with medical professionals and discuss a full spectrum of health-related subjects. It all starts in three, two, one. Thank you so much for being with us this morning, Loretta. How are you doing? Hi, it's great to be here. Thanks. Oh my gosh. I'm so excited for this conversation. Just uh, learning a little bit about your background and um, the seven books you've written, I think is what you said, um, is just fascinating to me. And this conversation, um, I think it's a really important one. And, you know, here at Invigor Medical, we're really focused on um, health and longevity. Um, and so much of that is mental and what are the connections and how do we get ourselves to do the things that we know we need to do, but we don't do them and just dig ourselves in these holes. So I'm really excited to kind of dig in with you and learn all of the information that um, you are clearly just a well of knowledge. Um, so first, I'm, I'm kind of curious, how did you get started in this field of brain hormones and what sparked your interest um, in this area of study? Sure. Uh, well, like many people, I was surrounded by a lot of unhappiness when I was a child. Mm -hmm. And I was always trying to figure out what is everybody so upset about? And then when I went to college and I learned academic psychology, I thought, oh, this is it. Now I have the answer. And now I'm going to do everything by the book and everything's going to work out right. Right. And then when I raised my own children and had thousands of students, then I thought, like, this is not really working. <laughs> um, so I was skeptical about academic psychology and looked for deeper understandings and when I stumbled on, I started reading about the animal brain and animal behavior. And I stumbled on the fact that animals have the same brain chemicals that we have. Oh. And the chemicals that we always hear about that make us happy, like dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphin, that they're the same in animals. And in animals, they produce uh, specific behaviors that are like eerily familiar and yet you don't hear much about that and animals can't cover up their responses. So they're mm. a much better way to understand how our chemistry works. Oh, that's so interesting. I wouldn't have even expected that, that animals are similar in that way. Yeah. So I, I know that you've talked about uh, in, pre in preparation for this podcast, I listened to some of the other podcasts you were on and watched some of the materials that you have on your YouTube, which are all fantastic. I and encourage our listeners mm -hmm. to check those out. Um, one of the things you talked about was the difference between like the reptilian brain and the mammalian brain and then like the verbal cortex. Um, I'm actually not super familiar with with the differences between each one of those. So could you dive a little bit into like what is the uh, reptilian brain and the mammalian brain and what is it? What is the major differences between those? Sure. Well, I'm I'll I'll explain them the way I understand it, which is not the same as what you hear in academic psychology or in a lot of the alternative psychology either. Yeah. So to me, the important thing is that the animal brain cannot process language. So it can't tell you in words why it's releasing a chemical. And so we're always feeling these strong chemical responses, both pleasant and unpleasant, but we don't know why why our brain is turning them on. So mm -hmm. we try to explain them with the verbal part of our brain, which is influenced by other people, what you hear other people say and how they explain their chemistry. And by the formal instruction that we get that says, oh, you're happy because of this, or you should be happy because of that. Sure. And so we're not connected to what really stimulates our positive and negative chemistry until we see what stimulates them in animals. And then we say, oh, wow, that, that, that's not what I wanted to think, but that really explains things. So that's one whole answer. Then another whole separate answer is that um, 
the what's called the reptile brain is connected to your body and what's called what i call the mammal brain which is the limbic system that controls your chemistry that's connected to your reptile brain which is more just what's called the basic metabolic functions are controlled by the lizard brain the sort of social interactions are controlled by the mammal brain because mammals are social and then the cortex, which is the pink fluffy thing on top that we see in images of the brain, that controls language and analysis and abstraction, but it's not connected to the body. So the hmm. only way you can get yourself to do anything is by going through your lower brains. So when you hear people say, oh, you shouldn't be in your lower brain, that's just foolishness. You can't function without using your different brains together. So a, a quick question to touch on that. So when say people are saying you don't want to be in your lower brain, I'm guessing that's probably because it has more to do with like the fight or flight states, because those are very basic to survival. And really nowadays, it's very easy to get triggered to be in a state of anxiousness. It, do you think that that's kind of what they're talking about? Uh, that is what they're talking about. But they are not getting the big picture. Because mm. if you're animal brain is creating this fight or flight state, then if you say, well, I'm just not going to be in my animal brain. So that's not really the solution. The solution is to soothe your animal brain, because what mm. is it really mm. looking for is I want to be safe and I know I want to know that my needs will be met. So creating peace with your mammal brain is more valuable than pretending that you could ignore it because you can't and it just alerts you more and more if you try to ignore it. So the analogy I use is a horse and rider. So if a rider says, well, my horse is irrational, so I'm just going to ignore the horse, that's just not a realistic prospect. So again, so that's one whole part of it. But then the other part of it is when you say, well, I'm just going to stay in my rational brain so I don't go into that emotion, but your rational brain is just as programmed by your past experience as your mammal brain is. Hmm. Are we, we're born with billions of neurons, but no connections between them. And we build those connections from experience. So your verbal conscious brain is still a, a sort of very controlled by your past experience. And I call this the, um, um, oh, now I'm forgetting again. Um, uh, oh, I say that instead of thinking it's rational is that it rationalizes. So okay. the conscious verbal brain is always rationalizing and coming up with stuff that makes you sound good, <laughs> uh, despite the fact that you're having all these reactions that you can't understand. Right. That makes sense. And it's it's just such an interesting way to kind of look at it because I feel like in today's world, we're having more conversations around mental health and what's happening when you're in that, you know, alarm state and how to get out of it. Um, and I think it is really uh, important, as you said, to note that like that part of your brain, it will rationalize away things and then you still need to find a way to soothe that reptilian part of your brain. Is that what I'm hearing you say? Yes, yeah, soothe the reptilian and mammalian, which is, yes. I just generalize it because all mammals have a reptilian brain inside them. Gotcha, gotcha. So um, in one of your books, Habits of a Happy Brain, I'm guessing this is something that you talk about a lot. And so maybe we could um, we could dive into that a little bit, a bit and like break down the hormones that are responsible for happy feelings and maybe tell us what are the main hormones that are responsible for us to have that happy brain. Sure. Um, I focus on dopamine, serotonin, oxytocin, and endorphin. And each of these is a different feeling that meets a different survival need and let's say rewards you for a different behavior. Okay. So uh, with that being said, you know, I, I was watching, you have a whole series about this on your thing. They were like five minutes long and they're very simple, which I appreciate. And it's kind of like, uh, I felt like I was getting a lecture from my mom when I was in elementary school again. And it's just like, this, this is very basic understanding. And it like, I enjoyed it a lot. Um, but each one of those hormones that you talked about, the dopamine, oxytocin, serotonin, and, and uh, endorphins, I feel like 
society as a whole has has heard these words before and you hear these words like dopamine hit and mm -hmm. you know oh oxytocin is a cuddle hormone and all these different things and i'm sure there's a lot of uh, uh misnomers and myths around that can you dive into like are there any myths about any of those uh specific chemicals that just like drive you crazy <laughs> Oh, thank you for asking. <laughs> She's like, how much time do we have today? Yeah, exactly, exactly. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so um, this is the topic of my new book. Um, so I'll go into it in detail. My new book will be out in January 2024. That's exciting. Um, it's called Why You're Unhappy, Biology Versus Politics. Mm. And uh, just simple, sim mm, where can I start? So <laughs> for each one, well, so here, the, the common perception is that these chemicals should be on all the time for mm. no reason. Mm. And other people are getting them all the time for no reason. It's just not true. First, nobody is getting them all the time because they're designed to turn on in short spurts and then they turn off once the need has been met or the action has been taken, and it wouldn't really benefit you to have them on all the time because they're designed to convey information about specific moments when the behavior would be beneficial. Okay. So the other thing, nobody's getting them all the time and nobody's getting them without effort because they design, they're designed to reward you for making an effort to meet a survival need rather than just sort of blissfully sitting on the couch. Mm -hmm. And then the final part of this is the idea that if you don't have them all the time, that you have a disorder. Because mm -hmm. when you believe it's a disorder, then you feel like you're broken and someone else should fix you, rather than saying these chemicals are triggered by certain actions and I can build the skill of taking those actions in healthy ways rather than unhealthy ways. Okay, so tell us what are the actions that we can take to have these hormones in this happy brain and get that natural flow and release of those happening? Sure. Um, so first, it's, it's, again, complex, and this is going to be extremely condensed. It's not something simple like eat turmeric and take a hot bath. Or <laughs> oh, that. man. I was really hoping for an easy fix like that. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> They can, you know, and it's uh, fortunately, see, I'm not selling anything. So mm -hmm. most people are selling something and then there's like, oh, it'll all be solved if you buy my handy dandy. So of course, you know? right. Uh, so that's why I very much don't want to sell anything except these books, which are really cheap. So, um, <laughs> uh, so um, what it takes is a behavior that meets your needs. But how do you define meeting your needs right. is with um, the animal perspective to understand what an animal wants to meet their needs. Okay. Plus whatever um, turn the chemical on in your past triggered the chemicals mm. because that's what wired your expectations about what will turn them on today. So I'll just give you some simple examples. So um, dopamine is the expectation that you're about to meet a need. So if you're a monkey and you wake up in the morning and you're hungry, you have to look around for food. And when you see food in the distance, that turns on your dopamine and you say, wow, that's a way to meet my need. So the monkey takes steps toward the, the fruit and each step closer stimulates more dopamine. And then when the monkey finally gets the fruit, then its dopamine stops because the need has already been met. Hmm. So in, in uh, the world of our ancestors, they had to look for food all the time. And that's the way their dopamine worked. But in the modern world, when you could easily get enough calories to meet your needs with very little effort, we have all this energy left and all of this desire to meet our needs in some other way to stimulate it. And that leads to, you know, all the various problems that people can think of. But the main solution is that in the modern world, we focus on meeting social needs. Mm -hmm. And um, uh, when you understand that your dopamine pathways or expectations are built by your past experience, it tells you why you get excited about this or that. And if you are 
pursuing things that you would rather not be pursuing, then you just need to pursue something else because your brain just uses the pathways you have. So you'll just keep pursuing whatever worked before until you build a new pathway. Hmm. That's super interesting. Cause as you're talking, I'm trying to think about like, well, what do I pursue like for that dopamine hit? And like, I personally love, I'm, I always say I'm a new experiences junkie. I love trying new things. That's why I love to travel. And so that like gets me really excited, like going to a new place, going on a new hike, um, getting something new, (laughs) you know, those are things that, yeah. So is that, is that like what you're saying? Those would be things that like my brain has been trained to get that dopamine hit, to go after those things. Yes, exactly, exactly. And those are relatively healthy ways. Um, if you're uh, not paying your bills, then obviously traveling. <laughs> then we have a problem. Bills, right. <laughs> but once you've done enough of the um, new and improved in, in the context of meeting real needs, then we look for additional stimulation because the dopamine feels good. Mm-hmm. And if you don't look out further than the other more unfortunate ways that listeners could possibly be thinking of is like eating a pint of ice cream, Mm. ordering a pizza, looking for a bar that's still open, for example. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, and, and I feel like uh, a big thing that's been an issue across the United States is uh, attention deficit disorder Mm -hmm. uh, and, and other situations that are like that. And I know that a big drive for people with that condition is like things that spike dopamine uh, at a very large level, right? And so uh, people that have these attention deficit disorders, I know a lot of times it leads, uh, they also are uh, in tandem with very addictive behaviors. Um, Can you talk a little bit about dopamine's role in addiction and and, uh, like if there's any kind of good strategies for being able to counteract those? Sure. So let's start with this simple idea that like, if a person goes on vacation and leaves their dog a week's worth of food, that the dog's probably going to eat all the food on the first day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Right? True. As much as you wish it wouldn't. So we are all born with this animal brain and we're all born crying. So mm-hmm. we're all born with this sense of urgency. Like I, I have these needs to meet and I don't know how to meet them and I'm going to die. So um, what happens? Gradually, slowly, over time, we learn new ways to manage that sense of urgency and new ways to give ourselves the feeling that I can meet my needs. But then, like, I can't meet my needs by just eating the whole pint of ice cream at once. Because once I'm done with that pint of ice cream, then what? You know? Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I'm going to eat another pint. So that's why it's always a challenge to manage this animal brain that we've inherited. Now, the other important thing is, so we're born with very few connections between our neurons, but whatever connections we build when we are young, those become the like highway system of your brain because of something called myelin, which paves mm. neural pathways and makes them super efficient. So my myelinated pathways from, I were, from when I was young <clears throat> tell me how to manage my attention and my reward-seeking behavior. So in the past, let's just say child grows up on a farm and they can't eat butter unless they milk the cow. Hmm. They can't eat, period. You know, they can't drink unless they walk to the well and carry water. But today, you know, you have a toddler who tantrums for food and you maybe give them candy because they tantrumed and you want them to stop tantruming. Hmm. So they're getting rewards without managing that inner mammal. And they're myelinating pathways for um, behaviors that are not helpful in adult life. So what are some examples of things that people can do in order to trigger a healthy dopamine response versus, you know, what we're talking about are probably more typical things in the day and age that we live in? Sure. So the way I talk about it is to have a long run goal, a short run goal and a middle term goal. Mm -hmm. 
Okay. So the idea of a short run goal is that you always have some excitement in your daily life. So you always um, set a goal that you can reach, a goal that you could reach, you know, before bedtime, not save it to the last minute, maybe do it before lunch okay. um, and something that feels good. And um, I try to use a goal that gives you some sense of pride and accomplishment. So what I say is... Um, if your desk is a, is a mess, choose a six inch square of your desk and sort that out before lunchtime. And you get like a dopamine reward. Like I, I did something mm. and it's something that's small enough that you're sure you can accomplish, but still big enough to excite you. Now, a long run goal is what unfortunately our education system has called like your passion. Hmm. And the trouble with following your passion is that your brain doesn't give you dopamine unless you actually see yourself getting closer to the goal. Mm. So when people have these grandiose dreams, today's version is I want to be a YouTube influencer, <laughs> for example, <laughs> which, you know, my generation is I want to be a rock star. And, right. you know, 200 years ago, I want to go to California and find gold. <laughs> you know, yeah. Every generation, I want to discover a new continent by sailing around the world. Every generation has has that thing and you get excited when you think about it but if you don't find a way to get closer to that goal you stop getting the dopamine so that's sort of why like middle term goal is like dividing your um desires into manageable chunks that you can actually take so that let's say every month you can celebrate a certain accomplishment and every day of the week you're spending at least 10 minutes working toward that goal so that you're getting a little bit of dopamine from it every day. That makes a lot of sense. I was just thinking about whenever, if I start my day really well, uh, one of the things that I'll do is kind of lay out my day and and make a to-do list for specifically for work most of the time, because a lot of times, you know, you get to work, things start swirling around. And the next thing I know it's 3.30 and I'm like, what the hell did I do today? I have no idea. I know that I've been busy all day, but I have no concept of anything accomplished. And then I leave feeling defeated you know, and a little bit worried about the next day. But if I start my day and like just kind of brain dump and make a list, every mm -hmm. time I cross something off, it feels like a little hit to me. And when I, if I can leave for the day and I cross everything off, I feel like a gladiator. I'm like, who wants to fight me? I'm a rock star. <laughs> Look at me go. And so it's, as you're explaining that, I'm kind of thinking, I'm like, oh, that's dopamine. What I'm doing is I'm setting myself up for a healthy dopamine response. Is that right? Exactly. Very good. Yeah. Okay. And one thing you could even add to that is if anyone finds themselves lying around at night feeling bad hmm. uh, because of all the woulda, coulda, shoulda, you can start the list the night before hmm. because all those things are on your mind. I wish I did this and I could have done that. And I urgently am worried about whether I'll do that and make the list the night before. And the other thing I always say is um, like, you don't want to have more than like three big things on the list. The three hardest things, the three most frustrating obstacles do them first thing in the morning before you do anything else. Even Eat the frog, the as they journey. say. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. And then if you have more than three, then put them off to the next day, knowing that by the end of the week, you'll have eaten 15 dogs, you could say. <laughs> <laughs> and so I'm curious, what should people kind of be aware of and watch out for? Because I think that, you know, even just thinking of my own experiences, people are probably continually, continually unintentionally or unknowingly falling into patterns of like dopamine response or some of these other hormones that, um, that aren't good and, and they're not, they're not aware of what's happening. So what might be some triggers that people could watch out for, um, to, and, and then, you know, what would the, the, the flipping of that switch then be? Does that make sense? Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. the thing is it's highly individual because mm. each of us is wired by our own past experience. So one person sort of has, um, an unfortunate dopamine habit in this direction and another one has it in that direction. Like a simple example would be 
one person overworks while another person never gets anything done and spends a lot of time playing video games. You know, one person eats too much and another person eats too little and spends our whole day obsessing over their diet, mm -hmm. you know? So it, we all need to understand our own individual dopamine pathways and look for patterns. I explain all of this in my books. And then look for the early experience that built our patterns. And the early experience is not necessarily a conscious memory or conscious intent. But if you look for the pattern, you will always see an early experience that, said, let you, that fits the basic pattern. And you'll say, oh, that's why I'm always obsessed with this. Because at some point when I was young, I got rewarded for that. And that built a pathway that said, mm. this is the way to get rewards. Mm -hmm. That is really interesting. It sounds like it just really takes a lot of awareness and paying attention, which is good. And it's important because I think it's really easy to just kind of go through life and be in a pattern and not, not realize it at all. Yeah. And then just could keep repeating the cycle over and over again. And so I think this is something that's really important, you know, for people that are trying to get into new habits to better their health and longevity in this instance, which is again, something that, that we talk about a lot. Yeah, definitely. Yeah. And a good way to think about these patterns is in a spirit of self-acceptance because mm. so much, there's so much like what's wrong with you kind of memes going right. around and self-recrimination that makes a person not want to do this. So a method I suggest in all of my books is set your alarm to stop three times a day for one minute and sort of trace like, what was I thinking about? Um, and I have specific exercises for this. So that's a way to sort of extract your patterns of finding, you know, where you're going, what excites you, what, what upsets you. And then you could look for the patterns in your early experience, not in a blaming kind of way, but just what was I rewarded for? And what rewards did I observe around me when I was young? And how did that teach me that this is the way to go? And how could I honor that, but find maybe a healthier way to redirect it? Sure. Yeah. That makes sense. You know, uh, this has been a fantastic conversation about dopamine and I, I feel like we've really dived deep into it. I kind of want to, uh, dive into the next, uh, the hormone and I almost, and you can tell me whether this is a good analogy or not. I almost view all of these hormones as like different actors and the brain is a stage, right. And they all kind of have their, their separate parts that they have to play. And, and once it's, once they're done, they move off stage. Right. Um, so that being said, can we talk about oxytocin and the, and the role that they play in, in the mind? Great. Yeah. Okay. So oxytocin, as you mentioned, often called the cuddle chemical and from an animal perspective, we could call it uh, herd behavior. Mm. So mm. in the animal world, you feel safe and you lower your guard when your herd is around you. If you were isolated, you'd be so busy looking for predators that you couldn't put your head down and eat. So in order to meet your survival needs, you look for that nice, safe feeling of I'm surrounded by others so I can relax. Mm. And we are often encouraged to see this in a glorious, virtuous, altruistic way, but it's, it, it's fundamentally selfish that I want you to protect me so that I can fill my belly and a predator will see you first. <laughs> you <know? laughs> there, was a, there was a post by the, uh, who was it? It was the National Park Service. That was like, if you're running away from a bear, don't push down your friend. Even if you feel like your friendship has run its course. <laughs> I just thought that was hilarious. It is. <laughs> That's really good. If you see that sign, I'll have to look for that sign. I'll, I'll send it to you. I'll find it. I'll send it to you. I love it. <laughs> but in the animal world, they, they will just run and, you know, knock into a friend, except for the friend might have antlers and they might get poked, which is right. once again, self-interest. <laughs> so um, if you have this, um, glorious, um, heroic vision of animals cooperating and supporting each other, then daily life feels rather disappointing. Yeah. <laughs> so that's why I think it's so important to understand how it really works. So what we really want 
um, that what really triggers our oxytocin is the feeling that I am protected and therefore I can lower my guard and lowering your guard and relaxing, that's what feels good. So how do I know I'm protected? Well, I'll never feel protected if I find fault with everyone. Hmm. I'll never feel protected if I have unrealistic expectations, like a child gets protection that you don't get in adulthood. So if an adult expects the kind of, we call it um, unconditional support, that's not realistic for adulthood. So then you end up being disappointed all the time. So the hmm. key to oxytocin is really having realistic expectations. Now it's valuable to understand that um, shortcuts to oxytocin are pop popular because the facts of life are so challenging and uncomfortable. So one famous shortcut is going to the pub where everyone knows your name. And that's <laughs> why you feel like you can't have the good feeling unless you keep drinking or partying or whatever. Right. Now, another example is when people go to um, a stadium with 10,000 people, whether it's entertainment or politics or sports, you get that feeling of being in a big herd with a common cause, even though none of those people will be there for you in the morning. So that's another example of a shortcut. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. I never thought about that. But like, I love to go to the Gorge Amphitheater, which is, oh, yeah. you know, here in, in um, Washington, it's just an hour and a half from where we're sitting right now. And they call it God's Amphitheater. And it's absolutely gorgeous. Um, and uh, whenever I go to some shows down there, especially if I'm down in the front of the stage with this group of people, and everyone's like, in the energy of the show, and it is really one of my favorite places to be. And I hadn't really thought about it like that, let it like a herd experience. I've always thought of it as like energy, but I guess it also is hormonal. And that's crazy to me to think about it in those terms. It's the sense that you have a giant herd. Yeah. So you are sharing something. So that's the, uh, the sharing part is the intellectual part of your brain and the herd is the mammalian part of your brain. So each of us defines like, what does it take? for me to have this sense of protection. So in my brain defines it with whatever turned on my oxytocin in my past, and your brain defines it with whatever turned on your oxytocin in your past. Hmm, interesting. That makes a lot of sense. You know, it, I was just thinking about it. I, I was thinking about the, the, the moniker, uh, uh, the cuddle hormone, right? And how, the, how it got that name. And I know that there's a couple of pretty key stages where oxytocin gets released that a lot of people I'm sure are familiar with. Um, mother child bonding, milk let down, uh, birthing, there's huge spikes in oxytocin. I know that uh, post, uh, post a couple having uh, intimate relationships with each other, that there's a huge post, uh, huge post uh, uh, sex spike of oxytocin, right? Um, can you talk a little bit more about like, what is the role that oxytocin plays in those, uh, those types of conditions? Sure. This is the fascinating thing. One chemical can have a wide array of functions, and that's best understood from the perspective of cortisol, which we could talk about later, the stress yeah. hormone. And I have a lot of on that in my books and my website. Uh, so let's start with the um, maternal oxytocin in mammals. So the thing that amazed me is reptiles. This like clarifies everything. <laughs> a reptile doesn't have oxytocin except for during sex, which lasts for 10 seconds. Wow. <laughs> or <laughs> when it's laying I'm Sorry. <laughs> I, was just, I just realized you made a ridiculous <laughs> face, but I just... <laughs> I just wasn't expecting that fact. So, so guys, if you're feeling bad about how long it takes for you, for you in bed, just know that you're not as bad as an alligator. And if you are, you might need some help. It's even shorter in birds. <laughs> even shorter in oh birds? Oh, my gosh. So, oh, my so, goodness. Oh, man, I wouldn't even go there. Yeah, it's okay. Crazy. So okay. oxytocin for reptiles only when they're having sex and only for 10 seconds, I suddenly feel bad for reptiles like what an existence oh, but i mean yeah. i guess they don't know yeah, differently yeah, so exactly. it is so maybe that's why so they look the so thing. here's like, the other thing yeah so um when a female reptile is laying an egg oxytocin triggers the contractions of the egg laying muscle wow 
which is the exact same thing as anyone in the medical field knows that oxytocin triggers labor retract labor contractions in all mammals. And so, and so apart from it also triggers lactation, but before that it triggers uterine contractions that cause labor and delivery. So you could see wow. that it's the same basic muscle. Now, the bottom line though, is that you get little bits of, of oxytocin when you feel safe in a group, but reptiles don't get that at all. And reptiles have an every reptile for itself lifestyle. They, they never stick together. Hmm. Mammals stick together, but not all the time. They would prefer to go their own way because when they're too close together, the only food that's accessible to them has already been peed on and trampled on. <laughs> <laughs> so they would rather trot off to greener pasture, but when they do that, they smell a predator and then they go back to the herd. Mm. So oxytocin motivates you to stick with the herd, despite the fact that they get in your face and their antlers are poking you all the time. So that's why we're always making that difficult decision between how much do I want to tolerate other people's antlers and how much do I want to go off my own way? So there's now, kind of like when this. You take all of that to, oh, so oh, let me just say, when you, you take ahead. all of that to the couple relationship, so, oh my gosh, so that's complicated. But so, yeah, so sex is a big spike in oxytocin, but then the next morning you might have no oxytocin at all. Mm -hmm. So, so that offers different solutions, let's just say. Definitely. Well, and, and that's it kind of elaborates as well, like kind of this tension between dopamine and oxytocin, where it's like, yeah, you want to be able to go out and, and do these things. But in fact, I, I almost see this like on a uh, you see this in a lot of like personality tests where you have people that are wanting to get things done and they trample over people to get it done. Then you have the other people that are like, no, you have to respect the feelings of other people. And and then a lot of times they they don't end up getting anything done because they're too busy trying to get all these things figured out. So that's that's a really interesting tension that I've never really thought about before. Um, and it's natural. That's the important thing. It doesn't mean that something has gone wrong. The tension is natural. And I explain every gazelle is making this de decision every minute. Should my next step be toward the herd or toward the greener pasture. And mm -hmm. after that, they make the same decision with the next step. So if the gazelle brain is designed to deal with that, then we can deal with that. Mm -hmm. Definitely. I had another question that you were talking about with oxytocin, how hormones can have various roles throughout the body, depending on where they are. Um, there is a study that I'm familiar with. I'd have to actually like pull it up and, and send it to you as well so that you can review it. But where men who took intranasal oxytocin actually had reduced appetites. Do you know anything about that and may, why that might, uh, why oxytocin might trigger that response? And, uh, yeah, I would say, so the brain is designed to focus on the unmet need. It mm. doesn't waste energy on needs that have already been met. So the oxytocin tells them, okay, that needs already been met. Now let's move on to the next thing. That's okay. the way I would interpret it. That makes a lot of sense. Hmm, that's really interesting. Um, okay, so we've talked a lot about dopamine and now oxytocin. Uh, what were the other two? Uh, serotonin, serotonin and uh, endorphins, right? Yeah. Yeah. And okay, so let's talk about how serotonin levels affect mood. Um, and what are some ways that people can boost their serotonin naturally or in, in a healthy way? Sure. So I have a very different perspective on serotonin from the disease model that's widely accepted in today's world. So what I stumbled on and what changed my whole perception of life and my career was studies from the 1980s that um, an animal, a monkey serotonin was boosted by rising in the hierarchy of its troop. So this whole idea that mammals and monkeys and apes have a social hierarchy in their troop, that had been understood for almost a century. And I was like, wow, nobody ever told me wow. this. And yet it's it's like the, after that, I collected all the books and the <laughs> library on this. But um, so it's understood that there's a mammalian social hierarchy in every group and Rising in that hierarchy stimulates your serotonin, gets you more food and more mating opportunity, which leads to more surviving copies of your genes, 
which is the simple message of any class in evolutionary biology or any introductory textbook on evolutionary biology would teach you this. But it's not so popular today because it's not politically correct. Yeah. So um, uh, we have this strong urge to rise in status because um, our mammal brain rewards us with serotonin when we do. And it's important to think that serotonin is not aggression, but it's a relaxed feeling of saying, I can get enough bananas, even though all these other monkeys around me are grabbing bananas because I'm, I'm strong enough to, to get the banana. And in the animal world, if you ever watch nature videos, you see that the big monkeys steal the bananas from little monkeys all the time. Mm -hmm. And little monkeys are scared to even put their hand out and reach because they get bitten and it can do permanent damage. So you don't put your hand out and reach and assert yourself until you first make a social comparison and see that you're in the one-up position. And then your brain releases the serotonin. And it's so easy to see that this is what we're driving ourselves crazy all the time is making this social comparison and reacting to our own conclusions about it. Do you, as you're describing this, I almost feel like uh, serotonin is, and this might be a good label, maybe not, you can tell me, it's, it's almost like a, a hormone of self-assurance of like, I like I can, I can handle this situation, like whether that's in the status of who you're around or just like facing what the situation that you're facing. Yes. And so that if you have a lack of that serotonin, it's like, you're going to be anxious. You're going to have increased amount of cortisol. You're going to have all these uh, really uh, anxious feelings. Um, so, so that being said, what what can people do uh, to make sure that they have a healthy amount of serotonin? Obviously, you don't want to like put all the people down around and down and say, "No, I'm better than you." <laughs> My like, bananas. That's that's <laughs> that's, a, that's a, not really a good thing, and it kind of works again. Here we are talking about these actors and it uh, just serotonin work in the long run. Yeah, it, well, and, and it's acting uh, contrary to the to the actor oxytocin, right? Saying like, no, no, no I'm better than the group, and the and oxytocin saying like, no, you got to maintain your relationship with the group to be able to survive. So yeah, how, how do you how do you balance all that? Yeah, so like you said, so it's confidence in your own strength is whenever you think. I have the strength necessary to meet my needs. So that's built on a realistic interpretation mm. of what your needs are and a realistic interpretation of your strength. And when I say realistic, that includes not dwelling on the social comparison of like so many people are in this belief system of like other people get things easily and it's not fair. And like social media people, portrays that like big time. And I'm guessing that's a huge problem with uh, uh, a lot of people that I'm sure you've interacted with. Yeah. So a simple way I explain it is um, if you think I'll be happy forever, if like a young person wants to be an actor and they think I'll be happy forever if I get a part, but then when they get a part, they're not happy because it's not a big part and they think maybe bigger actors are looking down at them. And then finally they get a big part and they think they'll be happy forever, but they're not because then they think, well, I want to win an award and then I want to be a director. And so then they see that other people are winning awards and other people are getting director's roles. So there is no achievement that can ever be good enough that can give you guaranteed serotonin forever. It can only come from inside you by saying, I'm safe because I have enough strength to meet my needs, whether or not I get this particular role or that particular role. Hmm. I would have never thought of it being described that way. Serotonin is kind of like, I, I, I don't even know how I thought of it before, of like what was giving me that boost, but it's really interesting to think about it that way. And, and, and honestly, I'm still kind of like processing the differences because I think it's easy to like see or feel or me personally being unaware of how I kind of, you know, oxytocin, dopamine, serotonin kind of all bleed together in my mind of it's like, oh, it just feels good. Like it's feel good feeling, yeah. you know? And so this is just really interesting. Um, and you brought up cortisol a little bit ago too, as well. Um, which of course is the stress hormone. 
<clears throat> excuse me, can you can you explain a bit about the impact it has on our body on our bodies and maybe share some strategies um, for managing our cortisol levels um, a, a little better? Sure. And first, um, when you said, you know, that you never thought of serotonin this way, this is not reported anywhere except in my books. But I got this all from research in the 80s and 90s where it was sort of widely reported or not widely, but in quite a number of books, which I've collected. And it was reported in the New York Times. And it's based on research done by the National Institute for Mental Health and UCLA Medical School. So I'm not making it up. Yeah. yeah. And, and the idea of the social hierarchy was in just decades and decades of books. So this has all disappeared because partly it's uncomfortable and partly it's because it conflicts with the disease model of mental health. Now, moving on to cortisol. So uh, I find it helpful to focus on the positive job that cortisol is there to do. So you know, you would get, you would walk into the street and get run over if you didn't have your cortisol system creating that sense of caution when you do something that you realize is a threat based on the neural pathways you built from past experience. Now, it's easy to worry too much about too many threats because we have such a big brain mm -hmm. that is able to abstract. And our brain and our cortisol is designed to anticipate threats in time to avoid them. That's why we have a big brain. Is like in, uh, instead of touching the hot fire and then pulling my hand away, is I anticipate that the fire will hurt and pull my hand back before. So with such a big brain, we're just anticipating every possible threat and we're aware of our own mortality, which animals are not, but we don't know what will kill us. So we're just going crazy, anticipating every possible threat. Now, in addition to that, we're feeding this, this natural inclination by watching the news and bonding with other people who share our sense of threat. So we're just feeding mm -hmm. that, that threat machine all the time, and we're not realizing that we're creating it ourselves. And then when this is defined as a disorder, that suggests that you don't have control over it. So you don't do what it takes to control it. Right. Yeah, I, I know that there's a, a pretty clear correlation between depression and having spikes of cortisol in the afternoon, which uh, Andrew Huberman, who's I, I've talked about him a lot on the podcast. <laughs> He's, I'm a total fanboy. Um, one of the things he talks about to ensure that you don't have as massive of a spike of uh, cortisol in the evening is to make sure that you go and basically view the sunrise first thing in the morning and that that actually causes this cortisol spike that gets you going. Um, it's also part of the reason why like I work out first thing in the morning because you know I, I put myself under a lot of that stress of a, a barbell or whatever is, is about to come down and crush me that I have to push up. Um, can, you, can you speak a little bit more about, uh, I guess, why, how much, uh, I'm trying to think of how to phrase this question. Uh, is cortisol a finite thing in the mind? And it, like, I've, cause I've heard that if you spike your cortisol heavier in the morning, there isn't as much uh, for you to affect you in the evening. Is that in a correct, is that a correct uh, understanding of that or, or how does that exactly work? Well, I don't doubt that there are people who have studies that say that, but um, if I, I just look at things from an animal perspective. Okay. So when a, when a monkey wakes up in the morning, it's hungry and mm. hunger is cortisol. Cortisol gets you going and says, you're going to starve to death if you don't find food soon. So that's its job. So cortisol always has a job to do. So I, I'm not really a big fan of like spiking it artificially. <laughs> um, especially this current fad about putting yourself in cold water. I'm sure somebody hmm. has done studies that, you know, find something. But um, so in the monkey world, in the animal world, if you wait until you're so starving that your energy is low, then you're even less likely to be able to chase something down and, and fill your belly. So cortisol is that advanced warning system that says, you better get going to meet your needs. Now, how we interpret that 
is individual. Like one person is, I better not be late for work or my boss might fire me. Mm -hmm. I better not let my kid have a breakdown because then I'm not going to get them to school on time. Or maybe an entrepreneur who's completely self-directed and said, you know, I better get going on this because I'll have a great sense of pride when I accomplish it. That would be like a self-directed way to look at it. So having done all that, I think you could still have plenty of cortisol at night for so many reasons. So one of them is that stupid thing of watching the news and bonding mm. around cortisol. But another one is something that um, Roy Baumeister calls ego depletion. So mm. ego depletion is this idea that I have self-control in certain circumstances, but then other time my self-control goes to hell. When do I have self-control? When don't I have self-control? A lot of it is learned, and maybe I'm better at it in this situation than that, but a lot of it depends on my level of energy. So mm. at the end of the day, when your energy is lower, it's harder to resist things. It's harder to resist the pint of ice cream, and it's hard to resist the negative thinking about everything's going into hell and I'm going to die and all my loved ones are going to die and the earth's going to die and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. blah, blah, blah. Another term for that, uh, you, you say the news. I think that uh, millennials have doom scrolling. Yes. Doom where, scrolling, where yes. they scroll and they say the world's on fire and someone died in a submarine and, you know, all these <laughs> things. The right? killer whales are attacking fishing boats. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so, you yeah, know, yeah. they're just scrolling and they're just I mean, spiraling you down. You feel it through your mirror, mirror neurons. This is like this I, um, toxic empathy where you've, Everyone who feels bad in the whole world, that your duty is to merge with their bad feelings. Mm. If you do that with your downtime, you can end up with cortisol. You're not going to sleep. And lack of sleep is really a problem because sleep is when you manufacture your happy chemicals. So if you don't get enough huh. sleep, you can't feel good. So it's really valuable, like, especially like at night, don't watch movies about buildings falling down and, mm -hmm. and slow death of cancer and, you know, none of that. So you're telling me that I shouldn't watch Schindler's List tonight. It, it was on my list, but I guess I'll just, I'll just leave that for another day. <laughs> or maybe watch it like before nine. Okay, and sounds then good. Do something relaxing. <laughs> So it sounds like you're saying finding ways to, A, avoid things that are triggering for cortisol that might increase cortisol before bed and finding things to add in that will uh, invest in your relaxation and going into that state of, of, of um, quiet and we're not in alarm and now we're ready to you know wind down yes. and get to bed. And yes. it, I'm guessing it could look like different things for different people. Exactly. It's very individual. And, and not just before bed, but throughout the day, anytime you have something stressful. So cortisol lasts in your body for about an hour. Wow. And during that wow. hour, if you your brain is just looking for evidence to prove something is wrong. <laughs> because that's how the brain works. When, right. a gazelle, when a gazelle smells a lion, it looks for evidence of where is the lion. So you don't want to be doing your problem solving while you're surging with cortisol. You need to have a little downtime then. So that's why, again, having some things that are prepared, that are ready, that you could use for your decompression time. Hmm. That's a good idea. Um, I was just trying to think of like, uh, because we're talking about stress, what do you, what is your opinion on like, obviously we talk about exercise, et cetera, like that. Like if I am feeling stressed like that and trying to get out of it, I, going and doing a workout or going for a walk, I know that it stresses your body, but it, that's different, right? Going and doing something like that is a useful way to kind of get out of the, the, the stress mode. Yeah. I almost think this might be a good segue into endorphins as well, because yeah. like when you work out, you're essentially intentionally uh, causing these micro traumas to your muscles and your body wants to release these endorphins to kind of help blunt the pain. Is that right? Uh, yes. Okay. Um, but this concept of an endorphin high caught on some years ago hmm. because endorphin was the first of these chemicals to be widely studied and understood, which is why um, people talk about um, runners high or endorphin high. I mean, people talk about endorphins as a synonym for happy chemicals in general, even right. though it's not. So the 
important biological fact is that endorphin is chemically the same as opioid. And our hmm. body evolved to release it when we're in pain. It's not meant, you're not meant to intentionally try to stimulate it to feel good. It's there for real emergencies because in the state of nature, if you're injured but you still have to run to save yourself, endorphin gives you a 15 minute window where the good feeling masks pain so you could save your life. And wow. then you need to feel the pain so that you could protect your injuries. So it's really not the path to happiness, in my opinion. The other chemicals were designed to seek, but endorphin is designed to be there for emergencies only. Now, we do need to exercise in the modern world because in the state of nature, and animals don't consciously exercise, but People who get into these sort of um, loop where chasing that endorphin high is the only path to happiness, I don't think that's, that's a good solution. So the solution to me is to understand the other chemicals. And then um, exercise is one way, but even like when people say, like if you are exercising, but you're having negative thoughts in your brain while you're doing it, you're not really getting that um, reward level. The same I say, like if you do yoga and you're stressing while you're doing the yoga by comparing yourself with others and et cetera, mm -hmm. that's not like this kind of full positive moment that you need to, sure. learn to create for yourself. So what is the feeling that you get after you get a good word, like the runner's high, or you've gone for just that walk in nature, like what chemical is that that's happening in that moment? Yeah. So, so they're different. So the workout where you're pushing past your limits to the point of pain, that's endorphin. Okay. A walk in nature, um, you get maybe a little bit from just m moving your circulation if you've been sitting still too long. But then other things in nature, um, I know that there are other views of this that people have sort of spiritual metaphysical views, but from an animal perspective, so there's a few things. So one, um, dopamine is stimulated by variety. Like when I scan my horizon and I take in surroundings that are different from my normal, that stimulates dopamine because you could see that our ancestors were foraging and they were always looking for new opportunities and variety created nutrition and things like that. So that's the dopamine part of this walk in the woods. Then, you know, nobody wants to admit it, but the serotonin part of the walk in the woods is like, I did it. I got away from my desk. I'm, I'm blazing a new trail and I'm getting to see this fabulous woods that, you know, my friends at home are stuck at their desk kind of mm -hmm. thing. You know? And if you happen um, to go on that walk with a friend, then you get the, uh, the little oxytocin hit. So exactly. there we go. So really what you're telling us is that if you can incorporate a walk out in nature with your friends, uh, and this is actually something that I do pretty much every day with uh, the guys that I work with. We uh, go on a walk every day and I take a, a rucksack with me. And every every time I take that rucksack off, it's it's a very heavy rucksack. And so I'm like, I did that. I feel good about that. So there's the serotonin, get the dopamine from the walk and get the oxytocin from hanging out with my friends and, and going and doing that. And I might get a little bit of endorphins because it, the rucksack is really <laughs> heavy. <some> damage. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's going crazy. Yeah. Whereas... The person who gets, let's say you get in a fight with someone mm. and then you go for a walk, but you spend the whole walk replaying the fight in your head and getting angrier and angrier about, well, if I say this, then they'll say that and that, and then you get madder and madder. Or if you spend it listening to the news, then then it's not going to do its job. So, so how, that's why it's How do you it's break out of those negative cycles? Yeah. So first is to be aware of it. And second is to understand your needs the way you just enumerated with the job of each chemical. And then what I suggest is creating a list of like a, I call it filling your pantry with healthy snacks mm -hmm. so that you always have something available um, when you're in a bad mood that you can go to quickly because when you're in a bad mood is not a good time to be shopping for that. And um, a simple example that I always use is comedy, because I find that 
comedy is very uplifting to me. However, I really have to do my shopping for comedy in advance because there's so many things that don't appeal to me so yeah. that I have something that appeals ready. Mm. I love that idea of comedy. It's what I talk about with my kids about introducing play. Like if we're kind of in the kids are in this like, and then I'm in there too. And we're all, you know, or it's one-on-one -on -one with the kids. And it's just like, you just feel like you're banging your head against the wall because everybody's frustrated. Probably everyone's tired or hungry or something. Um, and, and I even just find it for myself. I'm like, oh my gosh, I am just stuck in this loop with them. And so we talk, it's time to introduce some play. And sometimes we don't even verbally say it out loud, but one of us will kind of do something silly or kind of make a joke about the argument that's happening. And it kind of, it unless it's like really high level for one of us, usually it just kind of like cuts through everything and it resets and we're like, ha huh, ha, huh, oh yeah, we're being dumb. <laughs> we don't need to fight about this. Like, what are we even really mad about? Right. And so well, and that's, that's what you said about finding the pattern. Yeah. Yeah. And so I think that's, um, you know, what you just said about comedy. It, yeah. It sounds like just, just making, finding a disruption, right? A disruption of the pattern so that you can like reintroduce or start moving forward in a different way that's healthy. So, yeah. So when you talk about disruption, here's the thing. I call it healthy distraction. Okay. So if you are a gazelle, you only worry about lions when the actual lion is there on the prowl. If they worried about lions all the time, they wouldn't be able to meet their survival needs. Mm. But the big human brain is able to activate this image that a predator is about to get you even when the predator is not there. Mm. So that's how we drive ourselves crazy. So when you're having an argument with your family, you're thinking, oh my God, if my kids keep doing this, something terrible is going to happen. And they they're going to hate each other forever. <laughs> They'll never yeah. get along. And they, They'll they're hate thinking me. Their own, if I let you do that, then then, 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 yeah. then. So we're all creating this in our heads. Mm -hmm. But when you have a healthy distraction, it interrupts this mental image that you've created because your electricity is no longer flowing into that old pain pathway, but you're just giving it a new place to flow. But it will only flow into a new place if you create the place because the electricity in your brain flows into the big pathways. So you have to build a big relief pathway in order to have a healthy alternative. Hmm. It sounds like it'll take a lot of practice. Yeah. Right. It's not just like doing it once and all of a sudden fix that. Never going to be a problem again when I'm arguing <laughs> with my eight year old. <laughs> well, and you may notice that you're having the same arguments with your eight year old that you had with someone in your past. Could be a parent, could be mm -hmm. a sibling. But everyone, when, when, you know, when I encourage them, they're like, oh, my God, it's the same pattern. That is that is so crazy, too, because sometimes I'll be like, why am I dying on this hill? Like, is it really that important to me? Like, what is this actually about? And, and, I'll, and I'll realize how similar the engagement between me and my children is in that moment to what it was with my parents and myself. And I'm repeating this pattern, just like what you said. And so sometimes I'm like, you know what? No, this is something that's really important. And I do want to die on this hill. And other times I'm like, wow, not the hill I'm going to die on today. And then I have to kind of reframe and come back and be like, hey, you know, I'm sorry, I was wrong. Let's try this instead, um, whatever. But yeah, gaining the awareness, I will say it's it's difficult and also not always pleasant <laughs> to, to, get a, yeah. to get a good look at some of those patterns and be like, all right, yeah. okay, I'm yeah, going to be honest about that. Leaving because rather than reliving forever mm -hmm. that same conflict with your parents, then you get to say, oh, it's just a neural pathway mm -hmm. that got myelinated from early experience and my electricity is flowing there because it's there. Right. And that's all it is. And what really amazed me that, that I understood this, because, you know, my old pathways, they were so painful that it felt so real. But then I'd hear that other parents were getting totally upset over a totally different issue <laughs> uh, that didn't bother me at all. Right. But it was relevant to their story. Mm. And that helps you see how, you know... <laughs> You know, I, I think that this ties into a, a concept that we've talked about a couple of times here on the podcast, uh, neuroplasticity. Obviously, mm -hmm. these the, the myelination and, the, and all the uh, axons kind of firing and wiring together. Um, it's all about like 
trying to get our brain to rewire in, in adaptive ways. Uh, do you have any thoughts on, on good ways to trigger change in, in, on our uh, mindsets and, and how we view these things, like how we can actually change these patterns? Sure. So the first thing I emphasize is to accept that it's hard. Hmm. I, call, I say it's as hard as learning a foreign language while, commi- while quitting smoking. <laughs> <laughs> oh, wow. <laughs> because learning a foreign language is effectively repetition, building new pathways. Hmm. And quitting smoking is that um, emotional pull to the old pathway. Hmm. Sure. Uh, so what creates new pathways? I call it repetition, emotion, and youth. Youth means you have more myelin when you're young, so that builds the pathways easily. So once you're older, well, that's gone. So then emotion. What about emotion? Well, if something great happens, that wires it in. If something awful happens, that wires it in. But for those um, things that are related to higher values and small steps, they, there's not always an easy way to, to add emotion to it. So that's why repetition is our main tool. So dividing something that you want to do into small chunks that you're sure you can take and then taking it every day and then rewarding yourself after each step because that's how animal training works. Animals learn new behaviors because they take a small step and and get a reward. So you can um, create, again, a pantry full of healthy rewards that you can give yourself for taking these new steps to build new pathways. Definitely. You you touched on something that I had a question about, which you talked about how the the major factors with uh, um, neuroplasticity is youth, uh, what, what were the what were the other two? Youth, emotion, emotion, and repetition, and repetition. The nature of youth, I know it's kind of like the the axons are kind of spaghetti and they're kind of all over the place. But what other factors go into that? Are there like nutritional things? Because I know, for example, uh, B twelve is a major major component for myelin health and making sure that there's uh, uh, that 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 myelin is able to form. And I know as as people get older. B12 is something that is very is a very, very common deficiency. So how much of that is nutritional? How much of that is just like um, st- strictly structural of the brain? Um, can you can you speak to that just a little bit? Sure. Um, like I said, I, I'm not uh, I don't focus on individual nutrients because and maybe it works for people, but it's not fully known how much what you ingest goes to your brain. Yeah. Mm. So, so that's why I don't focus on that. But what, what's useful to know, so um, animals have a very short childhood. Uh, a monkey has a childhood of about two months, so they could be a parent, you know, by two months and a grandparent by four months. Wow. wow. And so the human childhood is tremendously long because we have a tremendous amount of neurons to organize. And so um, evolution worked for like 8 million years between the common ancestor of apes and humans. So we didn't spend that 8 million years to build this big brain and wire it up in this long childhood And then just to say, oh, I'm going to just ignore everything I learned when I was young. Right. So so those giant myelinated pathways are are like a huge huge accomplishment of our species. So we're not just there to delete them. Now, this myelination we have is we have a lot of myelination before age eight. And then again during puberty, because that's a time when... um, Uh, Humans often, and and mammals, often shift to new environments to find mating opportunity, and they have to rewire themselves to find resources in the new environment. So that's why we get a little reprieve during puberty to rewire our patterns. Hmm. But after that, you have much less myelin because in the state of nature, you started having babies right away, and you were 
putting so much energy into just finding enough food to keep them alive that you didn't have the energy to rewire yourself the way adults today think, oh, I'm going to just forget everything I learned as a child and rewire myself. So in the end, what little mile and I have in adulthood is spent just repairing. Hmm. Right. Excuse me. Repairing the myelin that I already have. Um, and it's not really available to build new pathways. The benefit of being a mature adult is that I can say, I'm going to take this new path. And even though it's not a big pathway, that I'm going to take it anyway, even though it takes more effort to slash a new trail through my jungle of neurons and blaze the trails in the back roads of my brain. And the example I use of that is if I study a foreign language and then I, let's say I go to Mexico and try to order a beer in, in Spanish mm -hmm. and I get so nervous trying to speak a foreign language, even though I'm trying to get a reward. Whereas if I say it in my native language, it's effortless because that's a myelinated pathway. Sure. Whereas a new language, I'm using a new pathway, but I can have the courage to speak the new language. And then if I speak the language, I get my meal at my Mexican restaurant. And that reward reinforces my, my confidence in my ability to build my new pathway. Yeah. I love the visualization. I've always loved the visualization of that sort of neural plasticity in the, in the, you know, the pathways in the brain and, um, you know, thinking about these pathways being like, I've always kind of thought of them as like highways and sometimes major freeways, depending on how early in life they were developed and how often they've been reinforced and used. And how, when you're trying to create that new pathway, it's like going through the, you know, the jungle there's no path and you you're you're out there with your jungle ninja sword or whatever kind of tool you took Starting you know scratch, if you're yeah. maybe you didn't even have a tool i don't know <laughs> hopefully you have some tools in the toolbox <laughs> uh, um, and you're just you're hacking through everything and it's going to take time and it's going to take work and every time you go through it again the path becomes clearer and the path becomes clearer but you you know every, you know it's just like a trail out in you know um I don't know, up on Badger Mountain or wherever else right. it might be. The first time they cut it, it's like, keep cutting the weeds, keep cutting the grass, keep cutting the weeds, keep cutting the grass. And eventually they stop growing back as much yeah. because it's continually that process. And I just think that's, I love that visualization. Um, and, you know, and it's just a reminder. It's like to tend to not give up, you know, and that it's worth it to try to, you know, create these healthy pathways in the and brain. And that it gets easier. And that it does get easier. Right. It's kind of also just like working a muscle. Right. When you're going to the gym and it's like the first time you try, <laughs> try to curl those 25 pound dumbbells, it doesn't feel good, no, it does <laughs> but, not. but start with a little bit less and keep building up and it will get easier. That's yeah. great. Yeah. And the other thing is, um, if you blaze a new trail through the jungle and then you go back the next day, the trail grows over. Mm. So you have to do it every day to make yeah. it get easier. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Okay. Well, hey, Loretta, this has been a wonderful conversation. Um, I know that there's other books that you've written as well. Uh, can you give us a little bit of a breakdown on what those are and where people can find you and find those books? Sure. My website is innermammalinstitute.org, innermammalinstitute.org. So I have lots and lots of free resources that explain all of this. And you could sign up for a free five-day happy chemical jumpstart to get a, an email on each of the chemicals. Um, my other book, so I have a book called Tame Your Anxiety, um, Wiring Your Brain for Happiness. I have a book called The Science of Positivity, um, Stop Negative Thought Patterns by Changing Your Brain Chemistry. And um, Status Games, Why We Stop, um, Status Games, Why We Play and How to Stop, which is about um, the serotonin aspect of life and how to get command of it. And I have a course that helps you apply all of these things to yourself in a, with videos. And you can find, people can find all of that at innermammal.org. Sorry. Inner, innermammalinstitute.org. Innermammalinstitute.org. Okay, perfect.
Awesome. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. I think this has been a really interesting look at these really important hormones and functions in the body and in the brain. And um, I'm sure that people will be able to take a lot from this and, and, and apply it into their lives to have a better, happier, fuller life, which is what we're all about here at Invigor Medical. So thank you so much for taking the time to chat with us today. It's really been, it's really been amazing. It's been great. It's been a pleasure, Loretta. Thanks for the great questions. All right. Bye-bye. Have a good right. day. Bye. Bye-bye. Okay.